the village prior to the restoration, it had a old charm to it. It was quaint in a way. The village was rustic. Things were undeveloped. It was a venue that was sort of struggling to keep up. Like any city, the infrastructure was in dire need of updating. The village was built in the 1920s, late 1920s, with labor and materials of the time. We were certainly in the early 2000s, you know, decades old as an organization. And the village itself wasn't conducive to new guest experiences that were accessible to all of our guests. There were big issues, things that held us back from, I think, reaching our full potential. We had failing sewer systems. Uh, the infrastructure was crumbling a bit. The roads were not smooth and paved. We didn't have enough power that went throughout. And we were under the potential that at any point in time, we would be without power if it failed for weeks. We are really starting to grow the evening program. I mean, Halloween had always been a mainstay, but we were moving that into the next generation. And of course there was holiday nights. These are both after dark programs. Just to say they were dark. These were dark programs. We had no lighting. We couldn't grow the village any further. It, it had reached its sort of apex in terms of where it was gonna be able to go. We needed to create an environment that would give us opportunity to really present our best foot forward. The president at the time, Steve Hamp, really had a vision for what this could be. He was setting the platform, not just for his tenure and his time here, but for how we could use it well into the future. One of the major goals in the restoration was the stabilization of the village infrastructure. I've heard described as, you know, the 100 year fix to move ahead for the next century. Another major goal was really making the place accessible to everyone. That had a lot to do with the choice of the, the road system, the sidewalk system. People love this place. Our visitors love this place, but our staff loves this place. And so for us to say we were, we were going to be closed for nine months was really a big deal. I remember the excitement, but also the awareness they had of how hard it was going to be. In the fall of 2002, announcement had begun and we actually started the, the process of closing down the village to begin work. All the power was cut, all the gas service was cut, all the water was cut. We had to take measures to protect the items that are displayed in the historic structures. We were worried about vibrations from the construction. First of all, we started by removing everything that was on or near a wall or a window. That included removing all the jars that are in Menlo Lab here. But we knew there were still gonna be a lot of things at risk. Furniture with veneer, watercolor and oil paintings, things like that. We kind of went through selectively and, and removed items and temporarily stored them over the course of the project. As part of the restoration, uh, 10 structures were removed. It was really kind of trying to bring things into more thematic and, and kind of move outliers into an area that made more sense for them. We really did sort of reorganize. We're standing in the Liberty Craftworks, which was designed and pulled over the carding mill you know, pulled in assets that were essential to craft. Some of the biggest challenges were that we were taking 
uh, a two to three year project than trying to jam it into nine months. We were definitely taking a risk, but we also knew we could do it. And uh, Denise Thal, who was our then vice president and CFO, was really brilliant in um, mapping out the kinds of funds that would be necessary to do the project, but also the losses we would take from being closed for nine months. Throughout the course of the project, just about every square inch of the ground in the village was either a pile of dirt or a hole. It was just kind of an exponential level of activity greater than anything we'd ever tried to do before. You know, Christian Overland is the head of the village and Robert Hanna as the head of facilities and maintenance. They were standing shoulder to shoulder during this whole process, really managing the day to day. And it was huge because we had hundreds of people working at one time. I think we refer to it as the massive ballet. Weather was formidable. This is one of the coldest winters on record. The ground froze so deeply that everybody was worried that we wouldn't be able to open in time. We literally used ground thaw blankets to unfreeze portions of the road so that we could pour the road in the spring. So many hands came together and heads came together, but it was really about the heart of not just this place, but the heart of all these people coming together to create something of, of massive significance. The village is a better place for the redo. We created, for the first time, a really comprehensive wayfinding system. So doing that created the historic districts that we still adhere to today. With the new road system, we're able to offer Model T rides and several million people have now experienced what it was like to ride in a Model T. But the biggest impact were the nighttime programs and those were on, on the rise uh, even prior to 2003. Now we have the ability to really light the village, providing way more light than there ever would have been in the past. We're here to inspire people and we want as many people to come here so that they can engage and be inspired to make a better future, learning about those great traditions of innovation, ingenuity, and resourcefulness. And I think the restoration gave us the ability to do it better. The fact that we as an institution were able to, to pull this off and make this massive project happen in the hardest of conditions really helped us get a sense of what, what our capacity as an institution was. We continue to grow and evolve. We are quickly working towards including the 20th century, even the mid 20th century here in Greenfield Village, with this spring, uh, the acquisition of the, the Jackson House. So in the next couple of years, the Jackson House will be reassembled in Greenfield Village. And that infrastructure that we built during the restoration process is going to be critical to us reassembling that home. The inherent power of this site is just so amazing and it really touches that secret place of awe in everybody and that's the beauty of Greenfield Village. You know, I know the experiences are going to be here, the place is going to be here, but the people who lead it and the people that create, that's what this is all about. Mm -hmm.